Welcome to Laconia, visitor. You're here to learn about Spartan society, yes? Then I won't stop you. Sparta had a unique hierarchy, especially compared to the rest of Greece. Everyone had their place, and you will soon learn what those places were. I will find you again once your visit has ended. Until then, visitor. Spartan society was structured around austerity, self-sufficiency, and a hostility towards foreign elements. It was divided into three social classes, citizens, perioikoi, and helots. Citizens were called Spartans, or homoioi. They were free men and women with mostly equal rights and wealth, though their contributions to political life were extremely limited. The perioikoi lived in surrounding areas under Spartan control. They cultivated the land and were primarily merchants and craftsmen. They were also part of the army, and their lands were the first line of defense in the event of a hostile attack. Helots were Sparta's lowest class. They were people who had lost their freedom to the Spartans, and they served the city as slaves. Helots were considered property instead of people. As a result, they had no political or civil rights. Helots made up the majority of Sparta's population. According to Polydeuces, they lingered between slavery and freedom. Two elements made Helots differ from other slaves. They were allowed to form their own families, and they were publicly owned by the city of Sparta instead of private citizens. Because Helots were deemed public property, they could not be sold as merchandise. They mostly worked to cultivate the land, but also fought in wars alongside the Spartans. While they gave the fruits of their labor to Sparta, they also kept a fair part of it for themselves. This practice allowed some helots to make enough money to buy their own freedom. Alternatively, if a helot served the state well enough in military campaigns, they could also be granted civil rights. The founding of Sparta is dated around the 9th century BCE. Historical information about the city is limited, but it was known to extend into the region of Laconia. Over time, Sparta started encroaching on the territory of Messenia, eventually leading to war. Sparta gained more land in this conflict, which they divided between their citizens and the Perioikoi. The aftermath of the Second Mycenaean War, from 640 to 620 BCE, then divided the population into three groups, the Homoioi, the Perioikoi, and the Helots. The Helots of Laconia mostly respected Sparta's rule and did not cause much trouble. However, Helots from Mycenae supposedly resisted the Spartans, although sources can only confirm one revolt for certain, which occurred in Messenia in 464 BCE. During the 5th century BCE, Helots were quite active in the army, especially during the Peloponnesian War. They served as hoplites on land and as rowers during naval battles. In both cases, they gave Sparta an important numerical advantage. For every Spartan on the battlefield, there were at least seven Helots. Although many ancient sources say Spartans had a hostile relationship with Helots, they were much more likely to treat them better in times of war. For example, when 300 Helots and 120 elite Spartans were captured by Athens during the Battle of Sphacteria in 425 BCE, the Spartans promised the Helots their freedom if they served them well in combat. Similarly, around the same time, the Spartan general Brasidas fought a battle alongside 700 Helots. Impressed by their courage and loyalty, Brasidas later freed them all and allowed them to join the Perioikoi. Perioikoi were another group of Sparta's population. They lived not in the city itself, but in its surrounding areas. The Perioikoi were never hostile against the Spartans, 
In fact, both groups together were known by the collective name Lacedaemonians. Perioikic cities had their own autonomy and sanctuaries, but they were always bound to Sparta. They were allowed to develop their own local laws and economies, but could never reach a level of prosperity that rivaled their parent state. I see you've finished. I hope you have a better appreciation for Spartan society. Nothing we do is without a reason, and every man, woman, and child has a role to play. What would you like to do? Then you may leave. Farewell, visitor. Greetings, visitor. You stand in Sparta's political center, where all of the city's most important decisions were made. You should feel honored. Sparta's political system was unique in the Greek world. While Athenians wasted hours on end whining and wagging their tongues at each other, Spartan kings made their decisions swiftly and deliberately. They preferred action over words. Come find me again when you finish your visit. We will speak more then. Farewell. Sparta's political system differed from most of Greece's. One of its most distinctive features was that it was ruled by two kings. These kings belonged to two separate dynasties, the Europontids and the Aegeads, both of which were said to be descended from Heracles. Both kings shared equal powers, and disputes between them required the intervention of special magistrates known as ephors. However, if one of the kings were more charismatic or experienced, they could influence the weaker king's choices. Spartan kings had several responsibilities and functions. As lifetime magistrates, they were technically Sparta's priests and strategists, and their duties encompassed everything from politics to justice. Originally, both kings would lead military campaigns in times of war. However, from 507 BCE onwards, only one of the two kings could be head of the army. On the battlefield, kings were accompanied by 300 elite soldiers for protection. But being a king wasn't only about working and fighting, they enjoyed special privileges as well. Spartan kings lived at the expense of the city, owned royal estates in the surrounding Perioikic cities, and received the majority of the spoils of war. When they passed away, they were buried with special honors, and the population mourned them for a period of ten days. The kings of Sparta enjoyed many important religious honors. They were in charge of sacrifices, both during military campaigns and at home. The kings received double portions of the meat at all communal meals, and they were also the first to pour libations. They also personally conducted public sacrifices as priests, which helped remind their subjects of their divine connection to Heracles and Zeus. The ephors, or overseers, were five magistrates elected by the Spartan assembly. They were chosen from among Spartan citizens over 30 and served for one year with no possibility of re-election. The ephors played a large part in administrating the city and were considered the most democratic agents in the Spartan political system. They had judicial power and ordered the dispatching of the Spartan army during wars. They also met and negotiated with representatives from other states, 
in addition to running the Agoge, the Spartan education system. While not as powerful as the two kings, the ephors still held great sway over Sparta's affairs. The Gerousia was the Spartan Council of Elders. It was made up of the two current kings, as well as 28 elders called Gerontes. They were Spartan citizens over the age of 60, the cutoff age for military duty. They were elected for life by the Spartan Assembly. The Gerousia, similar to Athens' Boule, handled legislative and financial matters. It could submit bills and motions to the Assembly, and could also cancel Assembly decisions with the power of veto. To ensure that the right of veto did not weaken the assembly, ephors were introduced to keep the Gerousia in check and maintain a steady balance of power. This allowed Sparta to include more just elements in its political system. The Spartan assembly, or the appella, was made up of Spartan citizens who were over 30 years old. Its exact meeting place remains unknown, but it was presided over by a special member of the ephors called the eponymous ephor. The appella had limited authority, since any decision it made could be overruled by the gerousia. But thanks to the efforts of the ephors, it still played an important role in Spartan society. The appella dealt with topics like foreign affairs, war declarations, peace negotiations, and more. They also elected ephors and Gerousia members, and could both grant political rights to foreigners and remove them from Spartan citizens. Unlike the myriad sources on the functions of the Athenian assembly, the exact details of the appellas' decision-making process are unknown. I see you finished. I hope you feel more knowledgeable about the inner workings of Spartan politics. Our way of ruling was not conventional, to say the least. But it served our purpose as well. What would you like to do? Farewell, Visitor. May your travels be safe and carefree. Welcome, wanderer, to the democratic center of Athens, otherwise known as the Pnyx. The Pnyx was the meeting place of the Athenian assembly and the physical embodiment of democracy at work. This tour will give you insight into how citizens made decisions and kept the city running. We can talk more when you have finished the tour. See you soon, wanderer. The Athenian assembly was known as the Ecclesia. It met at the Pnyx 40 times a year to discuss various civic matters, and each session usually lasted a few hours. The word Pnyx is believed to mean something close to packed together. This was probably a reference to the fact that during meetings of the Ecclesia, the location would be filled to its capacity, with citizens packed in practically shoulder to shoulder. All male citizens were allowed to directly participate in the democratic process. Those over 20 years old had the right to speak and vote, while those over 30 could be elected to the higher position of magistrate. In total, there were approximately 30,000 citizens in Athens in the classical period. To draft and adopt decrees, 6,000 of them had to attend the meeting. Citizens came from all over Attica's ten districts to attend the meetings of the Ecclesia. The meeting was presided over by an executive council called the Pritones. Every session began with a sacrifice to Zeus Agoreos, the patron of the assembly. 
During the meeting, citizens delivered speeches from the Penix's platform on whatever issues the city faced. Afterwards, the issue was voted on with a show of hands from the gathered assembly. The Ecclesia made important decisions about subjects like grain importation, expenses, and declarations of war. While they could not directly enact laws, they had a say in appointing Athens legislators, which gave them a large role in shaping the city's daily operations. <laughs> While some citizens only participated in the sessions of the Ecclesia, others could become more involved in democracy as magistrates. Magistrates were elected from among Athenian citizens over 30. They were often successful orators and charismatic politicians, and they held much more sway over important decisions than the average citizen. One of the most famous magistrates was Pericles, who was so popular, he held his position for 15 years. In theory, every Athenian citizen over the age of 20 had the right to participate in the assembly. However, some of them lived far from the city, and others could not financially afford to miss a day of work to attend meetings. For these reasons, the city introduced a special allowance called a misthos ecclesiasticos in the 4th century BCE, meant to encourage participation. Originally, it was two obols, but the politician Cleon raised it to three. <laughs> Athens introduced several innovations that heavily influenced modern society, including theater, architecture, and philosophy. However, their greatest contribution was their democratic government, which introduced the concept of a city ruled by its citizens. The decision to adopt democracy as a government, a choice made in 508 BCE, shaped civilization as we know it and continues to affect us today. Hello again, Wanderer. I trust you appreciated learning about the inner workings of the city. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Very well. Farewell, Wanderer. Welcome to the Gymnasium of the Kinosaries, one of the many places where philosophers came to enrich the mind and enlighten the spirit. Education held a very important place in Greek society. The most prominent educators were philosophers, whose teachings ranged from everyday rituals to the makeup of the universe. Once your tour is complete, come find me and we can discuss what you've learned. Philosophy comes from the Greek word philosophia, or love of wisdom. This concept was in direct contrast with philochromatia, love of money. As of the second half of the fifth century BCE, Athens was known as Greece's capital of philosophy. Due to the rise of democracy, there was an increasing need for education beyond the basic subjects of elementary school. Athenian citizens needed to be able to participate in various functions of the democratic state, such as being elected for office, proposing new laws, engaging in military decisions, or simply defending their rights. Originally, Athens had no official school buildings for higher education. 
Sophists and philosophers taught either in private homes or in public spaces like the theater. To recruit young pupils for long-term curricula, they also held classes in Genesia, where young Athenians underwent physical training. The Sinosarges was a sanctuary to Heracles, located in the south suburb of Athens. At the beginning of the 4th century BCE, Antisthenes used this sanctuary as a teaching spot for his school of philosophy, the aptly named Cynicism. Any free citizen was allowed to involve themselves in the Athenian democratic process. However, to truly influence the flow of politics, their speech and rhetoric skills had to be impeccable. As a result, many sophists taught subjects like logic, reason, and eloquence. These were meant to help students achieve arete, or excellence. But this specific concept of excellence was often challenged, especially by other philosophers. For example, Plato, Socrates, and Isocrates preferred a more moral approach and argued that rhetoric should be used as a means to serve the greater good. Socrates and Plato went even further, declaring that philosophy and wisdom were not only useful tools, but also ethical virtues. Ancient Greek philosophy was multidisciplinary in nature. In addition to wisdom and logic, philosophers also studied and taught math, geometry, music theory, and even medicine. For example, the philosopher Prodicus wrote a treatise called On Human Nature, where he outlined various explanations on human physiology. Philosophy's influence was also great enough to affect medicine. Hippocratic physicians were known to incorporate philosophical ideas into their work. And the treatise on airs seems to be influenced by pre-Socratic theories on air being the first principle of the universe. The famed philosopher Socrates had an ambiguous relationship with sophists. In Plato's dialogues, Socrates is portrayed as being in constant opposition with the famous sophists of his time. Aristophanes' comedy, The Clouds, meanwhile, depicts Socrates as a sophist himself, constantly demanding payment for his teachings. Socrates was in fact very poor and made no money off his teachings. He also differed from the sophists in that while they only taught aristocratic youths, Socrates taught everyone, regardless of station. And fortunately, his controversial ideas and practices did not sit well with the city of Athens, and he was eventually tried for impiety. <laughs> Philosophy was not only a collection of ideas, but a way of life. According to philosopher Pierre Hadot, his ancient counterparts had a daily regime of spiritual exercises to combat their passions, doubts, and illusory beliefs. These exercises included meditation on death, contemplation of nature, or speaking with a friend or mentor. Philosophers also followed specific dress codes and diets. They were also part of a community of masters and students. These communities were created and strengthened in schools. Plato founded such a school in the early 4th century BCE when he purchased a property in a grove just outside of Athens. The school was designed to groom students into philosopher citizens who could eventually rule the city in a measured and fair manner. It followed its own rules and was open to both male and female disciples. I can tell by the crease in your brow that you're already puzzling over the new things you've learned. Don't be embarrassed. Even the wisest among us need to ask questions before they search for answers. Is there anything else you'd like to do? As you wish, Wanderer. Safe travels. <laughs>